All right, today, what are we doing today? We're gonna to start with a little bit of demo, like a demo interlude, I call it here, which is I wanna take card view and separate it out into its own file because it's getting significant enough that it doesn't really wanna live inside of our emoji memory game view. And also we're gonna show you a little bit uh, how to deal with constants in Swift because we're starting to accumulate some magic numbers in our code. and We wanna start being good about that. Then we are going to talk about another couple of things. You can see the theme this week has been, I'm trying to show you how things work behind the scenes. Last time it was how the whole layout engine works and how view builder works. And today I'm gonna to talk about shapes like rounded rectangle. How do people write those? And then I'm gonna talk about another behind the scene, a huge one, which is view modifier, right? Our new UI, we're just new modifiers everywhere. We're calling them, how do those work? How does one write a view modifier? And, all that and we have demos of course memorized for everything so let's go do this little demo interlude here and it's real simple i have my card view down here stuck inside of my emoji memory game view i'm just going to take this card view and put it in its own file super simple right file new file you really already know how to do this the card view is the Swift UI view, so I am going to pick the one in the lower left corner there. I'm going to call it card view. And of course, I'm going to make sure that I'm not eh, at the wrong level here. I want it to be down a level with all the rest of my stuff. And I want to choose the right directory here. So don't forget those. When I hit create, you can see it's created my card view and put it in the right place, thankfully. And I'm just going to go over here to memory game view. Got my a card view already here. You see it's already complaining that I have two versions of card view. So let's cut this one out of here and replace this over here with that one. And that just works. Card view, public struct, and putting in another class has no effect on its usability because of that. One thing, however, is we have an error and it's this error down here. The preview is trying to say, please create a card view for my preview, but we know that card view actually takes an argument, which is the card. Here's our init. We have to provide a card. We can't just call it card view without a card. And we want to anyway, because just like we have a nice preview of our game, we want to be able to have a preview of a card view. Now, when I did aspect B grid, remember I just commented out or deleted the preview. You know, aspect B grid is a combiner view. And so you have to come up with some fake data to do it. Whereas card view is not, card view is just a real view that's showing something. So we should put something in our preview that is at least minimally testing it out. Now this is a demo, so I'm not gonna put a whole ton of stuff in there, but let's just go down here and put something like, I don't know, we can create a card right in place. Let's say a memory game of string dot card. And this is the constructor for it right there. You can see, let me go ahead and tab and let's put some content. How about this letter X? And we need an ID is required. So maybe test one because this is preview, a preview test. And so it should be showing our card view. Where is it? I don't see it here. Well, we have this one pinned still. So it's showing that one, but look up here. There's our card view. It showed up as another thing we can click on. So here it is. Here's our card, big black face down card. And maybe we can see it a little better if we throw some padding around it. Maybe we'll make it a different color, or ground color green or something, so we can look at it. And putting padding and color and stuff like that in your preview, it's normal because you want to be able to, at a glance, make sure you haven't broken your card view as you're working on things here. Now, one thing I do notice here is that it, I'm kind of getting tired of typing memory game of string dot card everywhere. That's an awful lot of typing. Really, I just want it to be the card. And there's a way to avoid all that typing, which is to take this commonly typed type and make a type alias for it. I'm going to call it card. And it's just going to equal memory game of string dot card. And then down here, I can use that type I just alias called card to create my card view. So type aliases are a great way to take, especially when you have generics and don't cares and you end up with these long things, just zip, zip them down to something nice. Of course, type alias really almost creates a new type. It's identical to the other type and it's namespaced. 
So the fact that I did this here doesn't mean that I can like go up here and just say card right here. That's not going to work. This is going to get an error. Cannot find type card because it's namespace down to the preview. So if I wanted to do that here, I'd have to put this type alias up there as well. Now some people are tempted to make a type alias like that global. Just put it at the top level outside of any struct, which you can do. But again, if you were writing an app that had multiple card games, like maybe your card game from assignment three that you're writing and memorize, well, the cards might be different. And they both might call the thing card and have it be nested inside their uh, model or something like that. Uh, so you don't always want to just go global here. It's almost better to put the type alias where you need it. And so let's go ahead and use it here, though. It's a good place for it. Where else do we use it? Let's go search. See if we go over here to the search. We haven't done any searching, so I'm just going to do it. I'm going to search for memory game of string dot card and see where else we use it. And the answer is we use it here. Great. Right? Type alias here. Type alias. Good. Oh, over here in our view model. Right? Our view model used it a couple times. This is another place where I probably want to put this. Let's go ahead and cut that out and put card there. And go up here and put type alias card equals memory game of string dot card. I'm using it enough, I think, in here that my code will look a little nicer. Don't you agree if I put it there? Now, one other thing is that, like I said, this operates a new type. So if I go back to my card view, down here in my card view previews, I might want to call this one instead of memory game of string dot card, card view dot card, which might seem kind of weird, but this is the preview for the card view. So it makes sense to alias that to be card view dot card. And that type alias card views card that we didn't make it private. We could have, we could have said private type alias and it wouldn't have been available, but we didn't. So I can use that. Let's see. Let's type alias it. Well, let's go back to our preview here. We've got one card right here. Let's go make some more cards. I'm going to copy and paste this. And let's put it in an H stack, maybe. We're totally allowed to do this. Our preview can be anything we want. And this card, let's make this one face down. Is face up. Actually, we'll make this one be face up. We'll put this in first, actually. So now I've got a face up version of a card and a face down version of my card. So again, I'm trying to have my preview show me what is going on. How about also the matched? So let's take these, this and make another H stack. And down here, let's say is matched, it's true. So on the cards at the bottom, is matched, is true. And these two H stacks, of course, right now it's built two different previews, one for each of those H stacks. Isn't that kind of cool? But we could put them all on the same screen by putting them both in a V stack. So that's kind of fun, a way to uh, look at it. And we could try some different things in here. Likely, we might actually generate this from some data or algorithmically try to do every single possible possible version, right? Every is face up, every is match, different kinds of content. For example, we might try some content, let's say, instead of just saying content X, what we say, this is a very long string and I hope it fits. You can see that's kind of cool. It's fitting it in there, in our little aspect ratio one inside there. Although I noticed a couple of things I don't like about it, it's kind of right up against the edge, and it might be better if it was centered. So let's fix those problems. It's back in our card view up here. So centering it uh, is just a matter of another one of these little text things, which is called multi-line text alignment. How about centered? That centers them there. And we might also want to go here and say dot padding, maybe five or something like that. Give us a little bit of padding around the edge. And again, we would probably enhance our previews to test as much of this as we could so that anytime we want, like we're looking at our game over here and it seems to be working, but we can always just jump over and say, well, is our card part of the problem? If something looks bad, we can just click here and hopefully look in our preview. We got that. This is kind of a little microcosm of how you develop a view. 
You usually put it in its own file, it gets a preview, start doing some test cases in there so that you can quickly look at it. Now, this is not UI testing. All right? There's a whole other mechanism, which I'm not going to get to this quarter, which is too bad, but there's an incredible built-in mechanism for actually testing your UI, right? Having invariants and running the UI and actually seeing if it's doing what you think. Uh, but this is a quick way to just see, oh, is, is that working? It's kind of testing light, if you want to think of it that way. And down here, we could do other things too. Maybe I want to see what does it look like with an aspect ratio of four by three or something like that. I can do that too and have that in there. All right, the next thing I want to do is talk about constants because we have a lot of constants building up here. And we actually did something with a constant back here in our uh, emoji memory game view, which by the way, this is our entire emoji memory game view, very concisely drawing our entire system. It's because we've factored out things like the card and the aspect V grid into other small little pieces. This, again, I can't emphasize enough, break your UI up into small little pieces. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it's designed to be lots of small pieces, not gigantic views with 40 lines of code in their bodies. That's just not, the design methodology for Swift UI. So here we had a uh, constant there, aspect ratio. You see, I just said private let aspect ratio is two thirds. That's a perfectly fine way to do a constant. I, I have another one right here. You can kind of find your magic numbers, they're blue. So if you search through your code and look for blue numbers, it'll help you find them. But there's one right there, padding. Maybe I'll call that something like my spacing. Put up here private let spacing, it's also a CG float, equal four. Now this works when we only have two. I guess that's, is that all we got? Yeah, that's all there is. There's no more blue numbers. This is great. But what about something like card view that has a lot of blue numbers? Look at all the blue numbers here that are in card view. In card view, we want to be a little more verbose about our constants. Uh, and not just have a string of, you know, seven or eight, you know, let you this, let that. And this, here's how we do it. This is the way we do it. And I have, I told you I don't really like to do this too much, but I'm going to, which is the quick uh, fill in. And if you're following along, you don't want to type all that in, just skip this part where we're doing constants. You can go back and put the constants in later. But the important thing to understand here is that we do these uh, constants with private structs. And all we're trying to do with these constants is namespace them and type them because they have colon CG float, they're typed. But since these are statics, remember that the way to get out of static is the name of the type dot the static name. So these things have all gotten namespaced into my constant struct. And I've even sub namespaced some of them with my font size down there. So how do I use these? Well, let's go over here. Here is the corner radius. Some more space. And this corner radius is just going to be my constants dot corner radius. And same thing here with my line width. Constants dot line width. And same thing down here even with this padding. Constants dot inset. That's the inset from the edges of my card. And this guy right here, this is the largest font I'm willing to allow, 200 points. That is constants dot font size dot the largest. This 0.01 is actually the constants dot font size dot smallest divided by the constants dot font size dot largest. That's what that is. Now that's making my code wrap right there. And if I'm reading this code, I have to say, oh, what is this? So I could put that code up in here. What if I just have used this scale factor that I've said smallest divided by largest. And here I don't have to do the font size dot because I'm inside this struct. So you don't have to give the full names here. Then I can say constants font size dot scale factor. These structs give you a lot of flexibility because not only can you do this and do little calculations, you could have funks in there too. Constant functions, functions that are taking some data and making some constant calculation. They also force what's in here to be constants because they're their own structs inside your struct, so they can't see any of your vars that are in your outer struct, so they can't accidentally depend on something. They have to be constants. 
There's a lot of benefit from doing things this way. I also tend to put my constants, this is probably a matter of personal preference, but I tend to put them at the bottom of my struct. And the reason I do that is, of course, constants are important. They're what's driving the settings of my UI, but once I get them tweaked and set where I want, then I, I want them out of the way. I don't really want them to appear. When I first appear in my car view, look, I want to be seeing my init and my var body, kind of the main parts of my view. You see that there's still blue numbers here. Look at this, one, zero, zero, one. Those are blue numbers. Also, what about this, white? Isn't that kind of a constant, a constant color? And what about also color-wise back here in our memory game, there's this foreground color orange. Absolutely, you could put these things in your constants. There's no reason you couldn't say static let color colon type color equal something. However, white and black, and also some of the other colors like act color, it's not clear that you're gonna ever tweak that. Maybe you would. If you ever think that your card might want something besides a white background, then you would want to make this a constant. But black and white tend to be almost like one and zero, where they're not really meaningful constants. So a lot of times you'll see one and zero, especially for, with opacity. This is really just like saying opaque and fully transparent, uh, not be put in your constants. It, it's up to you, but you can sometimes see that. And then a color like orange over here, this could be a constant, but actually I claim really this wants to be view model dot color. I want my view model to be in charge of the color of my card. So I'm going to go back over to my view model here. Var color to type color, and I'll just return dot orange for now. Don't need the return here. In fact, I don't need the, any of these returns, these one liners. And then I would use that over here. The other thing about this color, I don't want to really bury this inside this cards bar. I'm going to elevate this to a higher level because it's really something being driven by my model. And I want it to be right up front that that's what's going on up there, this foreground color. So you can sometimes emphasize things by how high up the view hierarchy you bring them. If you bring them up towards the top, they're going to be in people's faces. If you bury them down the bottom, people might lose them. Not really know, where do I set their card color again? Oh, it's down in that bar, inside that bar. Something to think about there also in terms of scoping constants and things like that. All right, let's go back to our slides and talk about shapes. So shape is a protocol. It inherits from view. So everything that is a shape is also a view, rounded rectangle and all those. And you've seen some shapes already, circle and rounded rectangle, but there's other ones, capsule and non-rounded rectangle. And shapes draw themselves, as you've learned so far, by filling themselves with the current foreground color by default but we stroke and fill on them, fill, fill with arguments to change that. These stroke and fill modifiers, they are shape modifiers, not view modifiers. And they are essentially little functions that take a shape and stroke it or fill it to create a view. So they convert a shape into a view, essentially, by stroking or fill it, filling it. Now, I told you the shapes are already views, and they are. They serve as views that are filled. That's their default behavior. Now, I want to look at the arguments to stroke and fill here, these things that convert shape into a view. And it looked like fill, for example, took a color, right? We said fill.white to fill the background, but it actually is much more powerful than that. The function fill that works on shapes is actually a generic function. And we haven't seen this, I don't think I've shown you this, but this, just like you can have structs and classes that have don't cares, an individual function can have a don't care. And this function, fill, has a don't care called s, and it's the type of the argument to it. And it's a, not really a don't care, it's a care a little bit, because it's got where s is shape style. So a shape style is something that knows how to take a shape and do something to it to turn it into a view. And some examples of shape styles are colors, they know how to fill it in with that color. Image paint will paint an image into the shape. Angular and linear gradients will draw gradients, color gradients inside there to make that happen. But I'm mostly showing you this to, so that you know that 
generics are not just for structs. They can work on individual functions where you have a don't care. And we're going to see this one again down the road here, but I just wanted to introduce this to you. What if you want to create your own shape? Well, the shape protocol implements var body for you. So when you're implementing a shape, even though it behaves like a view because the shape behaves like a view, you don't have to do var body. The shape protocol by extension, and we haven't talked about part two of protocol, so you don't really know how extensions are used to make this work, but we use extensions, and an extension to the shape protocol implements var body. But in turn, it adds something that you have to implement, which is this thing, path in rect. So path in rect is like the var body, if you want to think of it that way, of a shape. And so the path is really just a little object that you're moving and adding lines and arcs to as you draw your shape, whatever it might be, a diamond shape or whatever. And uh, you just have to build it and return it. You can do that any way you want. I'm not really going to talk about all the things inside path that you can do, lines, arcs, bezier curves, all these things. You got the documentation for that. Um, I'm more going to focus on how we plug all that into a shape. And that's best shown by a demo. So let me show you what we're going to do by showing you what we're going to do next week. This, you recognize, is your Memorize app. This Memorize app has had animation added to it. It's got a lot of animation, so keep your eyes out and you're going to see a lot of things flying around on the screen here. Because next week, we're going to spend the whole week doing animation. But one of the animations we're going to do is a little countdown timer. When you flip a card face up, it starts counting down. And it's really encouraging you to pick the cards faster because you get more points. The more the thing counts down, the fewer points you get by the time you match it. So let's watch it do that. Okay, see the countdown timer behind it? Counting down right there. So I let that go all the way down, so I'm not going to get very many uh, points even if I match it. Let's flip there. Now when I flipped back, that one, its timer stopped. And so here, oh, I click that, and did you see the little plus two fly up? That was saying how many I got. So let me try and be better. Ooh, that was good, plus 13 popped up. Now watch this, I'm going to be bad and pick one I already passed, minus one fell down. So that, that's the same scoring as you guys had. If you have a mismatch, it goes down. So that little round pie that counts down, that's what we're gonna build. We're not gonna animate it today, but we're gonna build our own shape that builds like a little pie. Uh, one other thing that's happening here is, of course, we have our shuffle animation. Also, the card flipping. Look, it's not dissolving. It's actually flipping over, right? The card is flipping over. So we'll be doing a view modifier later in this lecture, and we'll animate that next week because all animation, you're going to find out, happens inside view modifiers, and that's how we're going to do that. Let's head over to our code and implement this little beauty. To do this so we can see what's going on, I'm actually going to change the number of cards I have down to four cards, and we're going to have them all be face up because we're going to put the pie on there. And when we put the pie on, we're going to want to see a nice large version what's going on with the pie there. Let's just start by taking our card view, which I happen to have on screen right here. You see, that's our card view. I'm just going to put a circle in there instead of the pie. So I'm going to put a circle. And this is a Z stack. So and these are grouped, but it's still a Z stack. And so I just pop the circle behind the text in the Z stack. We're almost done. <laughs> okay, really? Yeah. Got it now. It's not a pie, but it's a circle and it's there. Now, this bright orange is a little too bright. A little, it's not, you know, the timer's not that important. So let's take the circle and add a little bit of opacity. How about 0 0.5? That, that's pretty good. You could maybe go down to 0 0.4. See, now it's a little bit, it's transparent, it's a little bit lighter weight back there. We can kind of do whatever we want to make that look nice. Another thing I don't like, my pie is right up against the edge. Mm, that's not so good. So let's move that so that we have some extra padding. You see this padding that we have down here? I'm going to use that. I could put this in a Z stack, the circle text here. But we already learned about, remember dot background and dot overlay? So in this case, I'm going to overlay our text on top of the circle. And it also makes it, our code look a little nicer there as well. The only other thing maybe is, you see how Mr. Ghost, he's right up at the edge too? Maybe I want some padding in there. 
is also. So let's go here and say dot padding maybe five. Is that enough? Yeah, just just to get him in the edge. And some emojis might be so large they're going to stick out, but you know this this is probably a good size. We can play with the padding later. And really that padding should be a constant. So let's add that. Let's go to our constants down here. Add some more constants. Phi constants for the opacity and for that inset right there. This five is constants.pi.inset. And this opacity up here, I think I said 0.5 down there, but that's fine. Constants.pi.opacity. Now we want to actually build our pi. We're going to build our pi by making our own shape. Go up here, we're going to say file, new file. And it is a view, but it's a view because it's a shape. So we're actually going to pick Swift file here, not Swift UI view. The Swift UI view in the lower left, that just means you're going to get that preview thing at the bottom, that little stub for the previews. We don't want that for a shape. I'm going to do that. I'm going to call my shape pi. It's a little pi shape. I'm going to make sure I put it in the right place. All right, now we have our pi. And here it is. It's a UI thing, of course. So we're going to change this to Swift UI. And it's just a struct pi, and it implements the shape protocol. And whenever we do a protocol, we always get this thing where you don't, yeah, you said you were a shape, but you don't actually do it. And we always love to go here and say fix. And most of the time this works, and this time it did. But later in the lecture, you're going to see it doesn't always work. So you can't rely on that 100%. But it does work for shapes, which is good. Let's look at this path function that it wants me to build. I told you it wants to build a path. But you see, look, it's also got in rect. That rect right there, that's the rectangle, this purple thing in my graph here, that you're being asked to draw in. And it could be any size. You be asked to draw in any size. We're going to be drawing a pi. A pi is like a circle, so it's going to draw in the middle. One really important thing to understand about this rectangle and your drawing coordinates that you're given here is that big purple dot in the upper left. That is your drawing origin. Now you're used to Cartesian coordinates where the origin is here, and this is positive x, positive y. But when you draw an iOS, your origin here, this is positive y. Positive y is down. That takes some getting used to. For those of you who are used to Cartesian coordinates, it'll take some getting used to, and you're gonna see how it has an effect on this. Um, it's minor, but it will have an effect. So just be cognizant of the fact that that is your origin over there. Other than that, it's pretty easy. We just have to draw inside this rect. And you're going to do that by creating a path. So I'm going to say RP equals empty path. And then I'm going to return that path. And then in between, I'm going to do draw line, draw arc, draw Bezier curve, whatever I need to do to draw in this drawing coordinate system that I have here, this upside down system where the rect, that CG rect, by the way, I don't know if we need to go look at it, but let's do it. Here's CG rect in the documentation. You can see it's got some initializers, origin and size. It's got uh, origin and size are its basic properties. Origin is a point, size is a CG size, right? CG size is width and height. You can look through all this. It's exactly what you would think. There's nothing particularly special about the rect. We're going to use that rect, though, the coordinate system, to figure out where to put everything in our path. Let me show you this picture that I drew before class. I'm essentially going to have my pi draw from some start angle around to some end angle. And then when we animate, we're going to animate that. The start angle will be fixed, but the end angle will just be animated. Here's my center. I'm going to need to know the center. And then the start angle is going to be a certain angle off of here. And then the end angle is presumably farther around. So I would then draw this pie shape right in here if I did that. To know how to draw my pie, I need to know the start angle and I need to know the end angle. Those are the only vars in my pie. Var start angle. Now the start angle is going to be of type angle. It's got a nice built-in Swift thing. Uh, called angle. And angle, it's got really just two things. You can set the angle in degrees, like 350 degrees, or you can do it in radians, like pi over two or something like that. Does everyone know the difference between radians and degrees? We can do either one there. Uh, I'm going to make this a var and have it have a default. How about degree zero? 
angle radian zero could be. And there's actually even something for this, a built-in, which is angle dot zero. It's the same thing. And of course, I can infer this. I don't really need to say that. Now, my end angle, I'm not going to have it have a default. you got to give me one of the two angles. So I'm going to have just let end angle here be an angle. So that's going to be a required argument to my shape. So you give me those two things, I'm going to draw this. Now, how am I going to draw it? I'm going to start in the center here. That's why I mark this center. Then I'm going to move up to this start point, right, along the start angle. Move here. Then I'm going to draw an arc around to this end angle. And then I'm going to go back to the middle. That's how I'm going to make my pie shape there. So I need the center. Let's get the center, the local variable. I'll let center equal a CG point. CG point takes X value, which is going to be my rex middle X. And a Y is my rex mid Y. Mid X and mid Y are just bars, computed bars on a rectangle that tell you the middle. First thing I'm going to do in my path here is I'm going to move to that point. So P dot move to the center. There's a difference between moving in paths and drawing lines to paths. Here I'm just moving without drawing on my way. I'm just moving there so that I can start there. Now I need to get this point, this start point, because now I'm going to add a line up to here before I go around. How do I get that point? That point, call it start. Let start equal, and it's a CG point. And we have to do some geometry here. I don't know if you can all remember uh, your geometry lessons, but it looks like this. My X is just going to be my center plus whatever my radius is. We'll have to figure that out. Times cosine, you ever heard of that? Start angle, and radians, of course. We're doing uh, uh, cosine, we need radians. And y is center Y plus the radius again times the sine of the start angle in radians. I'm not going to take time out to go over geometry again, but it's pretty obvious there that that's what it is, sine and cosine. That's what gives us our way of getting, if we're on this angle right here, to get up to there. I need my radius. The radius here is going to be the lesser of this way or this way, because you see, because I'm going to draw this fully fitting inside my rectangle, so I'm going to Check this distance and this distance and pick the shorter one. That's going to be the radius of my circle. Let's do that. Let, let the radius equal the minimum of my rex width and my rex height and divided by two because it's the radius, not the diameter. Okay, so that's that. Uh, notice that it's saying ambiguous use of cosine. Swift has many packages that have cosine in it, believe it or not. Uh, this one that we're doing is core graphics, so I'm going to import core graphics. There are other libraries that have their own cosines in there, so we're just we're doing core graphics here. Notice the CG rec, CG size, CG point. That CG is, stands for core graphics. That's all the drawing that we're doing. Now we've got from a line to go from here up to here. How do we do that? We're just going to go p dot add line to the start. Now we've got that line. Now we need an arc. We need to go from the start around to here. Amazingly, we can say p dot add arc. And there's a couple of different versions, but we're going to use this nice version. I'll go ahead and separate it out so you can see all the arguments. And we just need to provide these arguments. Incredibly, we actually happen to have these on hand from the other stuff we did. So the center is just the center. The radius is our radius. The start angle is our start angle. The end angle is our end angle. And clockwise, are we going clockwise here? Right, going around here. This is clockwise, right? Going around the clock. So we're going clockwise. We could say clockwise true. Maybe we could even make clockwise be an argument up here. Right, let clockwise rule, and uh, we'll make it a bar and have it default to true even, which means we wouldn't need this because of type inference. And then we go, we've gone around the arc. Now let's just move back, add a line back to the center. And that's it. We just created our nice little pie.
goes around from a start angle to an end angle. Make sense? It's as simple as that. And in your assignment three, you have to do a shape. It's just a very simple shape, like a diamond or something. This is how you're going to do it with this path. All right now that we have our pi, let's hop back to our card view. And instead of using a circle up here, let's put a pi. And if we do a pi, of course, it's demanding an end angle here. So let's pick an end angle of degrees 240, let's say. And voila, what's wrong? <laughs> okay, why? This, this was supposed to go from here around to here. This is about 240, right? This is 270, 189. So should, why isn't it drawing around there from zero? Because I didn't specify start angle, so it should be zero. What the heck is going on here? Well, two things going on. One, zero, when you're drawing here, is not straight up and down. You're used to that, compass rows, zero is straight up and down. Zero is actually out here. That's why it's starting right here. Now that's easy for us to fix. I want my pi to be in you know, compass rows coordinates. So I'm just gonna go back to my pi. And at the very beginning, I'm gonna let my start angle equal the start angle I already have minus 90 degrees. I'm gonna do that for both my start angle and my end angle. Now, it's kind of questionable maybe whether we should do this. One might argue, hey, if you're an iOS programmer, you should know that zero goes out to the right. You shouldn't be doing compass rows. I, I buy that argument. I, I could see that argument. But just for your, make it easier on you guys to see what's going on, I'm going to go ahead and say compass rows, coordinates for me. Now it's still wrong. This is counterclockwise. It started up here, but whoop, it's going the wrong way. It's supposed to be going around clockwise. What's happening here is this purple dot is getting us. So I would like everyone out there to get out of your seats and stand on your head so that your origin is up there and then look and tell me if this is counterclockwise or clockwise. You see, it goes the other way. If you're upside down and you watch it go around, oops, that's actually going clockwise. And our whole thing here is flipped upside down. So clockwise is the opposite direction. So in iOS, when you're going clockwise, it's the opposite direction. On Mac OS, incredibly, it's the other way. And it's really annoying, but that's the way it is. We really want our clockwise here to mean semantic clockwise. So I'm gonna say not clockwise that the person says, and voila, we got it. Nice little pie there. I will show a couple more things. If we go back to where we use this pie, it's possible to do that path thing in line. So I can actually say path P in and draw a path. Like I could say move to or dot zero, which is the origin, and then add a line to a CG point. That's let's say a hundred and a hundred. That makes a little path in kind of on the fly and then I can stroke it. See the, do you see the line there? Let's make it thicker even. I have a stroke with line width of six. See that line? It's going from the origin there, dot zero, over to 100, 100. And if I maybe made it be 50, 100, see that? Or if I made it be 50, 200, it goes farther down. So I, you can just make a path. In other words, path, that thing we built, behaves like a view and it has an initializer which hands you a path creates a path for you and lets you do your little deal in there other thing here notice if i try to do stroke border on this thing it does not work why can't i do stroke border in fact can i do stroke border can i do stroke or stroke border on my pie let's try that let's get rid of this path thing let's just see if my pie can do stroke border can it do it no. Stroke border is actually a function on something called insettable shape. Let's change this to stroke instead of stroke border so we compile here. And now if I go look at rounded rectangle in the documentation, and we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that it conforms to insettable shape. If you look at insettable shape, that protocol, you see that's where stroke border is. So the pi, we didn't make it conform to insettable shape. Stroke border strokes inside your border, so you have to be insettable to draw it. 
So we didn't do that, but we can do stroke. Look at that. And the default is fill, so we'll just take our fill. The tip for shape. Should be all ready to do assignment three for that. Now the next thing I want to talk about is view modifiers, but notice I have a little thing in the middle, animation, how does it work? I'm not gonna teach you anything about animation here. We're gonna do that next week. The whole week next week is animation, as I said. And one way to do animation is by animating shapes. So you might have a shape that's a little stick figure man and he's walking across the screen, right? You would have to change all those line to move to, so, you know, as it animated. So that is possible. You can animate shapes. But the other way to do it, which is really important, is view modifiers. In fact, view modifiers are the only way in Swift UI to do custom animation besides shapes. All of the animation that happens that is not just dissolving or views moving is done inside view modifiers. It kind of makes sense because animation is showing you change. That is what, you're gonna see this, me talk about this all the time next week. Animation is just visualization of change. And so, and view modifiers change views. That's what they do, they modify them. So when a modifier's arguments change or whatever, that can cause animation to happen. And you put the code that causes custom animation inside of view modifiers. So let's look at view modifiers and how they work. This is just an interesting topic on its own. How do we build those view modifiers? Dot foreground color and all these dot aspect ratio. How are those things built? Let's look at aspect ratio. Uh, now I've put aspect ratio two slash three. I've left off the content mode dot fit because my slides would all run off the edge. Okay, but you know that aspect ratio modifier has another argument. But anyway, how does aspect ratio two slash three, what is, how does it really work? Well, it's actually really a different view modifier called dot modifier. If you could replace aspect ratio two thirds with dot modifier, aspect rep modifier, which is a struct, which conforms to the view modifier protocol, two slash three as its argument. And that really is what's happening. The aspect two slash three is just some syntactic sugar. We're gonna do that syntactic sugar ourselves, uh, but that's all that's really happening there. Really what's going on is this dot modifier, give me a view modifier. The view modifier protocol only has one function inside of it, and it looks like this. It's called body content is the argument, return some view. You can see that this looks a lot like var body, but it's got this little extra argument right there. Read this carefully here. When we call dot modifier on a view, this content argument to the func body is that view that we just called it on, which makes sense, right? A view modifier takes another view and it modifies it. Well, here's a function called body that takes another view, that's its argument, content, content right there, and returns some view. Now, that content argument right there, what is that? That's a don't care. It's a don't, it's actually a care a little bit, a, it's a don't care that has to obviously implement the view protocol. We saw we did that with aspect vgrid. It's kind of a classic way to pass a view along there. Another way of putting this in code, kind of pseudocode, is a view dot modifier of my view modifier, which might take some arguments, is what if you did this line of code, then a view is going to be passed as the content to that my view modifiers view modifier. So it's super simple. It's exactly what you would think view modifiers are. You just implement this protocol, you get past the view that you're supposed to modify and you do something with it. Inside that func body, presumably you're gonna do something with the content, wrap it. If you're padding, you'll add some space, whatever. So this is, I think, best seen by example. And so the example we're gonna do is we're gonna create a view modifier that takes any view and cardifies it, turns it into a card like we have in our memorize game. So we're gonna pass our little pie with the emoji on it, and we're gonna take that view, and we're gonna modify it to be a card. So one line of code is gonna make that thing be a card. I'm gonna call this thing Cardify. Here's what the code would kinda look like. This is a little different version of our card down here, but it's similar, you get it. And the first line there, text of the ghost, See it has dot modifier cardify with is face up true. That's gonna draw a face up ghost card. 
consistent, and eventually we're going to have it be dot cardify with is faith up true, not dot modify or cardify. We'll have it be dot cardify. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Here's the code for that, and let's look at three interesting pieces. One is the content. You can see that the content is the text of the ghost. It is the argument to the funk body, and it is used inside our funk body where we would have had the content of the ghost, right? We have our rounded rectangles and then content. This is the face up of the card. That's where the content would be. So it just replaces it in there. Straightforward. Here is the is face up because our view modifier takes an argument, is face up. Well, that's just so that down here we can do is face up because we don't have card that is face up anymore. This is a generic cardifier. It knows nothing about memory game card. It'll cardify any view. And finally, just so you understand, this modifier, view modifier, it's going to return this view, the purple view. It's going to return a Z stack with all this stuff in here. That is essentially the view you're going to get by modifier. Obviously, the contents of that funk body. Uh, how do we get from dot modifier cardify is phase up to dot cardify? Extension. We're going to make an extension to the view protocol and add a function called cardify, and all it's going to do is do that, self.modifier cardify. That's how we do it. And we haven't really talked about extensions to protocols. It's a very important thing, but when we extend a protocol like this, it adds this function to every single view. So every single view can be cardified now. Let's see this in action, in Memorize. Let's start by going ahead and creating Cardify. Let's just file new. And it's not a Swift UI view. We're not going to have a preview. So here we'll call this Cardify. Let's give it the name of our view modifier. Show it in the right spot. Here it is. It's just another file. And it, of course, is part of the UI. We can say struct cardify implements the view modifier protocol. Now I told I warned you about this. It says you don't conform to view modifier. Oh, thanks. How about fix? Let's go fix that. Okay, it did not. I told you there was that funk body thing. What? Where is it? So I'm not going to explain why this is happening. It has to do with the way that view modifier protocol, it has it generic, it's generic, right? So it has uh, these don't cares and body is one of its don't cares. And what it's essentially saying here is, can you please tell me the type of the body I'm gonna build so that I can then make the right funk body for you. But that's of course ridiculous. We wanna use some view, so we're not gonna use this. So forget all that. I'm just gonna have to know that it's funk body takes content, which is a type content, that's the don't care in there, and it returns some view. And inside here, we're going to take that content, which can be any view, and we're going to cardify it. We already have the code that does cardification over in our card view, so let's go over to our card view and grab it. It's essentially the entire thing here. So let's just grab this whole code, put it over here inside this body. Now, we have to take some things out of here, like our pi, this whole thing that's our pi, that is what we're cardifying, so that doesn't go in here. That gets replaced with content, right? We're cardifying anything. So we, I took out what was in there for our card, and I replaced it with this content argument, which is the argument there to funk body. And we, of course, don't have card dot is face up anymore, so we have to get rid of card dot. But we still need is face up, so we'll just make that bar be a bar here. Is face up, which is a bool. And I'm not going to have that default, so let's go ahead and make that a let. That forces you to provide the is face up when you cardify something. You have to tell me whether you want me to cardify it face up or cardify it face down. And a couple other minor things here. We have these constants. Let's go back to our card view and grab the constants. I think it's only the first couple of them here. We won't need them over here. Over here, put it down at the bottom. Oh, sorry, it's face up is an argument to cardify. Sorry about that. Click in the wrong place there. This is our cardify. This is really all that's necessary to cardify something. 
put the rounded rectangle around it, the backing on it. When it's face down, just make it filled. Now let's go back to our card view and use this view modifier to cardify our content over there. So where is our content? Our content, our content is this piece right here, the pi with the end angle and the opacity and the overlay of the uh, emoji right there. I'm gonna cut that out of here and then just replace all of this junk with it. And I'm gonna ask to modifier it with a cardify modifier is face up, is my cards is face up. So this seems like just a factoring out of code thing, right? We put the cardification over there and it is a factoring out of code process, but it's also gonna set us up to do this animation because when we flip cards over right now, they just dissolve and we need them to do something much more complicated, a 3D turn. We need them to do a 3D turn as they flip and that's gonna happen every time face up changes. And I told you that view modifiers can custom animate change. That is the change that causes a flip, right? Face up goes from face up to face down. That's gonna cause a flip. That's where we're gonna do a custom animation and we'll do that uh, next time. Now, what about the fact that it says modifier cardify when really what we wanted to say is dot cardify face up. That's really would look nice. Well, anytime we do a view modifier like this, almost always at the bottom, we put an extension on view that adds a new func called cardify, which takes the argument, returns some view, and it's just going to return essentially self.modifier of that cardify with the is face up being the is face up argument. And we don't need return because it's a one liner. And we don't need self either because this is an extension of view. It's obviously we're sending this to ourselves. So this is how modifiers are built. And all those modifiers you see, they're doing the same pattern. They're doing different stuff inside their funk bodies here, of course, than we're doing. We're cardifying, but that's what they're doing. Cool. Make sure our card view still works. Yeah, look at that. Preview over there is also, that didn't break that either. Now the last thing I want to do, I actually promised I was going to do, is to clean this up a little bit to use background and overlay. Because really what's happening here is, as I was saying, saying before, you have this outline, that's the actual card. The white that we put in the background is just so that it works in dark mode. Remember that all the way back to, I don't know, first lecture? That's, that's just the background of this. So we should use dot background for it. I'm going to go up here, take my stroke border thing and say dot background is this fill. That is the background of that thing. And this content right here, that's the foreground. So I'm gonna say dot overlay of that content. When I do that, all of a sudden I don't need this group. Take that out of here, put this back. This all looks a lot more sensible and more meaningful. The content of this thing here is this stroke border with a background that's white so that it works in dark mode and the foreground the overlaid on top of it, but not controlling the size is the pie and the emoji. So this is really probably a little more correct and certainly probably the way you would want to write this. You're making it more explicit what's controlling the size here, the stroke border on the outside. We could have designed this card, by the way, in a different way where the size of this drives the size of the card. But we really wanted the card to be able to be small and big, depending on how many cards we had. So the design constraints of our system demanded we have a flexible size card. So that's why we're driving its size with the stroke border rather than driving it with the text, let's say. The so last thing I want to do here is just slides. I want to finish up the Swift type system. Remember I said protocols, I was going to tell you in two parts and I showed you part one. So here's part two of protocols. Let's go here, try to understand more about protocols. We've learned a lot about how protocols are used to essentially ask an object to behave in a certain way. But one of the most powerful uses of protocols that we haven't talked about is code sharing. I told you that protocols don't do implementation, they're implementation free. Well, that's true, but implementation can be added to a protocol 
by using extension. The same extension we use to add the only var back to array back when we did that, and the same extension we just used to add cardify to a protocol, where you can add any implementation you want, not just cardifies, you could do anything you want. And that's a super powerful feature, and it's really, when people come from object-oriented programming to this kind of programming, they're like, well, but what's really great about object-oriented programming is I can create an object that inherits all this great functionality from some other object. And that is true, but you are also highly constrained because you're gonna inherit all of that object's data representation too, and you might be a completely different kind of thing. There's a lot of functions you can imagine that apply just as well to a dictionary as they do for an array. But a dictionary and an array are going to have very different data storage going on, even a string versus an array. A string wouldn't, doesn't necessarily have to be implemented as an array of characters. And in fact, in Swift, it's not implemented that way. But they still want to share a lot of the same functions, like give me the last character, give me the last element of this array, same thing, right? And you want that code to be shared, and this allows you to do that. So first of all, using extension, we see how we got Cardify, and that's how we get all the view modifiers. Foreground, font, all those things, all are getting there for free by having an extension to view. But it's also how functions like filter and first index where, remember those things that we used? Those also get implemented as extensions. And those extensions can not only add new functions, they can also add default implementations of functions. And you can, if you want to think of it as overriding them, but not overriding in the object-oriented sense, just you're implementing them on your struct, but there's a default one in case you don't do it. And this ability to be able to default and then implement your own gives you a lot of the same power you get with object-oriented programming without all the restrictions of the data representations being the same. The reason that we sometimes call programming in Swift protocol-oriented programming instead of just pure functional programming is because of this. We are building our, our implementation using protocols. And up until now, I kept telling you protocols were just only the declaration of things, not the implementation. But now you're understanding that because we have extensions, they also are an enormous amount of actual implementation as well. So let's talk about filter function that we think belongs, lives in array, that will filter an array, right? You give it some function and it, it filters the array out. If that function turns true for an item in the array, then that it includes it, otherwise it does not. So that's filter. Well, filter works not just on array, it works on range and string and dictionary. These are all very different things. And the code for all of this is the same. And this code lives in the protocol Sequence. So sequence is a protocol that arrays and range and string and dictionary all implement. Of course, they are sequences of things. They can be sequenced. Sequence knows how to iterate through the things in the sequence. So once you have those fundamentals, then you can add an extension to sequence that will filter by just going through each one. Everyone buy that? So now are you just instantly seeing, oh yeah, I can see how I'm kind of getting inheritance, but I'm getting it across all different kinds of types that don't share anything common about their data representation. So let's talk about view, because it's one of the most important places where we're getting this implementation sharing. So view, we know, and all the things I'm gonna show you here, by the way, are kind of pseudo code. It's not exactly the way it looks, but it's kind of like this. So protocol view, as you probably picturing it, it has one var in its body, right? body that returns some view. But there's also something else like this in Swift. Extension to view, func foreground color, func font, func blur, all the hundreds of functions that you have in view are just in some extension to view. This is why I was kind of calling protocols constraints and gains. The protocol itself up there, var body, constrains a view. You have to implement var body, otherwise you can't be a view. And then the gains you get are all these functions that come in through this uh, extension. Now I want to talk a little bit more about protocols that are generic. We've seen this actually. Identifiable is a protocol with a don't care. And I just want to show you the syntax of it so that you, when you see this in the documentation or whatever, you're like, oh, I know what, I see what that is. 
look at identifiable. It only has this one thing in the protocol, which is this var ID, right? That's the ID you have to provide to be identifiable. And that ID is a don't care. Identifiable doesn't really care what you use to identify yourself, but it has to have something. But that don't care, uh, how is it defined? And you might see it defined in the same way as a struct, right? Protocol, identifiable, angle brackets, the thing. But oftentimes you'll see it as associated type ID underneath there. Uh, but you'll see it both ways at the bottom line. Sometimes angle brackets, sometimes this associated uh, type right here. Now, we actually know that that associated type, that don't care, is not really a full don't care. It's a care a little bit because whatever you provide as your ID, it has to be hashable. Because if you have a bunch of identifiable things, you want to be able to put them in a hash table and look them up. So you need that thing to be hashable. So of course, we have to add the where essentially to that. And so how do we add the where? How do we constrain it? Well, we can add where right on the associated type over there, associated type ID. And we can also just say associated type ID colon hashable. The same way we are allowed to do that when, for example, in aspect v grid, remember when we added its don't care, so we just put that right in the colon view and the colon identifiable right in there, we can do the same thing with the associated type. So when you're looking at the documentation and you see protocol and then associated type ID with some colon after it, you know what's going on there. That is an associated type and it's telling you what you need to do to satisfy that particular type. So if you're doing identifiable, you would go in there and you would realize, okay, my var ID, could be anything that can be hashed, string, int, anything I can hash. Let's talk about a couple of keywords that are used a lot with protocols, some and any. The sum keyword right here, it's used to pass something that implements a protocol opaquely into or out of a function or into or out of a var even. And what do I mean by opaquely? I mean that you're gonna pass this thing in and you're gonna know that it implements that protocol, but that's all you know. It could be anything. It just, you know, all you know is it implements that protocol. In other words, its type is opaque to you. It's like it's behind a wall. You can't see through the wall. You don't know what type it is, but you do know it conforms to that protocol. And when I say it can be passed in or out, I mean it could be a parameter to a function or it could be a return type of function. So let's look at sum as a return value. And this is the one you're most familiar with, like var body sum view. When you have a return type that is like this, one thing that's important is that the function always return the same type so that sum view can figure out what that is. Because when you have sum view as a return type, as you know, it's gonna look in here into the computed property and figure out what it is. So if you had something here where sometimes it returns a rounded rectangle and sometimes it returns a rectangle, which are two different types, then the compiler would complain here. It would say, basically what it's saying is, I can't figure out which shape it is because sometimes it's one thing, sometimes uh, it's another thing. So you're not allowed to do that. And with views, we don't notice it because we have view builders and they package all up into one view for us. So it always works in view builder. And that's why this works. Now here I've got some view and I'm returning a rounded rectangle. This works as long as this thing, this var body, is marked view builder, which it is. All of our bodies are view builder. But there's no such thing as a shape builder, so you can't do it that way. I mentioned this a little bit because you, know, you might be tempted to want to do this in your assignment three, and you can't do it. Now you can still use some view, however, in your assignment three as a parameter to a function. So let's talk about that. Some used when it's a parameter, an argument to a function. Remember that fill, I told you we're gonna go back to that, that fill generic function there, what to fill with? That can actually be rewritten like this. Fill, what to fill with is some shape style. So passing an argument that is some thing is just like having a generic right there where it's of that some type. I'll let this kind of sink in so you can compare these two. What we're essentially saying is fill, you can call fill and you can pass it anything that implements the shape style protocol. And I'm not going to know what it is and I don't care because I'm only going to, fill is only going to ask it to do shape style things. So it doesn't care if it's a linear gradient or a color or whatever. That's what some shape style there means. 
And that's why you could call circle fill image paint, image some image, right? And it would just figure it out because image paint is some shape style. It implements the shape style protocol, so it is some shape style. Now, how could you use that? Maybe in your assignment three, let's say. Maybe you have a function called fill and stroke. We know that we can't fill and stroke at the same time. We can only fill or stroke. But what if we wanted a function, fill and stroke this shape? Well, we could make a Z stack out of the fill and the stroke, exactly like we do with our cards. And we could implement a uh, function to do this. And the argument we would pass would be some shape. We don't care if this is a rounded rectangle or a circle, whatever. This is going to work because the only functions I'm using in here are things that shape do. So I can pass it in there. And this is returning some view, so that's okay. Z stack is some view. So you might might well want to do this in assignment three. Not required, but you, you do have multiple shapes, right, on your cards. Hopefully you've all looked at the assignment by now. Uh, and so you, you, I don't know if you want to fill and stroke them, but you might want to do things to the shapes, do it to any kind of shape. Now what about any? So you'll see this much more rarely. In fact, I doubt you'll use any at all in this course. But any is a way to essentially have a heterogeneous uh, array or container full of something that responds to a protocol. You could actually, for a lot of protocols, like here, protocol foo that just implements var and that's it, you could have an array of foo in that case. It would work. You wouldn't have to say array of any foo. You could just say array of foo and it would work. And of course, if you went through the array, you could only call bar on those things because that's all you know about those things in the array. No matter what they are, the only function you know about them. But if you have a more complicated protocol, especially ones that are self-referential, like the equatable one, right? If you remember the function for equatable, it's equals equal static func equals equals. The two arguments are of type the thing you're equating. So that protocol is self-referential. The argument types of the function inside of it refer to itself. So if you have a self-referential uh, protocol or you have a protocol that has generics in there, okay, then you can't just say array of foo. There's too many other variables going on. So that case, you do array of any of those things. So you could have an array of any identifiable. Even though identifiable has generics, wouldn't normally be able to put it in an array, you can say any identifiable. So imagine that this is an array that has rectangles and circles and other things in there, okay? The things in the rectangle are some shape, but you can't have an array of some shape because some shape resolves to a specific shape. It is some shape, not any shape, some shape. So you can't have an array of some shape, but you can have an array of any shape. And any shape is actually a different type than shape. It's kind of this boxed up shape. It's put in this box and the box is the type because in Swift arrays can only, everything in an array has to be of the same type. And so when you say an array of any shape, it's essentially an array of these boxes and the boxes are the same type, but what's in them can be different kinds uh, of shapes. Now here's the problem though. How do you get these things out of here and do anything with them? Because you, you can't just reference them and start doing identifiable things because you don't know the generic, for example. You don't know if that's an identifiable with string var or int, so you don't even know what to do to it. So how do you do it? Well, the answer is you gotta call a function that takes some identifiable, right? If you call, take one of these things, subscript this, and call a function some identifiable, it can unbox it and pass it in there. And this code is going to be working on a particular sum identifiable. So really, there are some other things you can do with an any identifiable, but mostly you have to pass it to a function that does some identifiable. So this one, for example, prints the identifiable's ID, okay, which is legal because this is going to be, Swift can convert anything to a string, so that'll work. That's the only way you can kind of deal with any identifiable. Don't worry about this too much. I don't expect to use that, you to use this in this class, the any identifiable or any. I just want you to know it's there because you're going to run across code. You're going to see some. You'll see some quite a bit. You've already seen some quite a bit. You'll see any much less frequently. But I just want you to know it's a thing. It's out there. You might be looking at all this and like, oh, my God, are you really expecting me to figure out how to uh, implement uh, these protocols with uh, generics and, you know, some, any, oh, it's just too much. How am I going to? No. 
I don't expect to be able to do all that. Uh, this stuff is a very powerful foundation for building very powerful systems like Swift UI, but it takes experience to master these things. The great thing about Swift UI is that you don't really need to be a master of all those things, ex using extensions to extend protocols and all that to make it work. I show it to you so that when you see it in the documentation, you're like, oh, I know what that is. I don't show it to you because I'm expecting you to start doing extensions to protocols and doing bell peg types and all this stuff. And right? so it's more about understanding what's going on than being able to do it. That is it. And next week is all about animation. Your homework assignment this week is to build your own card game. Your homework assignment next week is going to be to add animation to your card game. So that's a little preview of what's coming up.